Good morning, church. That was great singing. I'm tempted to say, amen, let's go to lunch. <laughs> One of the benefits of a uh, small church or the situations is, uh, is less chance it's going to be a spectator sport. So uh, if we went to a big mega church, the chances that it asked the humble old, old bald-headed fighter pilot to bring us a message are small. <laughs> but here at the small church, you're so gracious to let me share today. I appreciate that. Um, we've had a technical challenge today. Uh, all our clickers and backup clickers are out of order. So, <laughs> and um, I like the graphics. There probably may be more for me to keep my thoughts on track than hopefully not a distraction to you. So um, uh, I was just so blessed uh, last Sunday by the testimony from Bobby Ray. Uh, amen? amen? If you didn't get to uh, hear that, uh, I was recording it, and it's on our church website. So, praise God. You know, the scriptures say, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. So, I, by in part today, I want to share a little bit of my testimony, which is quite different than Bobby Ray's. I didn't go to Bourbon Street, New Orleans, Sin City, but um, maybe like, similar to you, I was blessed to grow up with a wonderful Christian family, saved as a young person, and I was so blessed. Uh, this song... Um, praising my Savior all the day long. I've been doing that for 57 years. Amen. Um, this has just been just a, a powerful, powerful experience. I'll, I'll give a little testimony how I came to know the Lord. And my passion that I want to try to pass on is moving beyond birth, spiritual birth, into growth. And how does that happen? How does spiritual growth happen to grow up to be full, fully Christ-like in all that he's called us to do and to be? Um, I'm going to uh, just tell a, a fun little story you may have heard before, and I want to say I resemble these remarks. Uh, <laughs> um, it kind of, in a way, shows part and parcel to my testimony. You've, uh, you may have heard the story about the duck church and the duck preacher. So there was a gathering of the ducks one day, and they had a wonderful service, and the duck preacher spoke eloquently about how God had given ducks wings with which to fly. He pounded his pulpit with his beak and said, With these wings, there is no way we ducks cannot go. There is no God-given task we ducks cannot accomplish. With these wings, we no longer need to waddle through life. We can soar high in the skies. The ducks quack, quack, quack. Amen, amen, brother, preach it. Um, throughout the congregation, the duck preacher concluded his message explaining one more time, with our wings, we can fly through life. We can fly. So the duck said, what a wonderful message. Uh, you really blessed us, pastor. And the ducks waddled back home again. <laughs> so a little bit, that's a little bit of my story. I was blessed with wonderful Christian parents, went to wonderful churches all over the world. But how many times did I listen to a wonderful service and I waddled back home again? I never reached out to fly, spiritually speaking. So uh, one of the passages we want to look at briefly was today was um, be, uh, the scripture talks about being transformed from glory to glory, increasing glory. One of the things, uh, as I've been walking with the Lord many times, if I hear a fellow believer say something to the effect of, this is just the way I am, I cannot change. And that's very problematic. The whole point of being a believer is you have infinite power available, the infinite God of the universe who spoke things into existence. If you've trusted Jesus as your Savior, you have the Holy Spirit, that same power that can change you. So the question today is, how does that happen? Um, we want to kind of take a look at that um, slide. Um, I so appreciated um, Bobby's message with the repeating theme, no man cared for my soul. He'd gone through life and many opportunities along the way. Someone who may have known the Savior didn't tell him a clear message about the Savior. And praise God, finally, was it a uh, co-worker or a boss or both? that um, was loved you, demonstrated Christ to you, and you came to faith in Christ and, and gloriously saved. 
um, slide. I'm so excited about the possibility of this upcoming sermon series from Pastor um, on Better Together at Christ Community Church. And the, the, uh, I, I pray that our, our passion as believers in this body is to, that the manifold, mes manifold message would be, we care for your soul. Not only if you're not a believer to come to know the Savior, but where are you in your walk with the Lord and how can we help each other move to the next step? <clears throat> so next slide. 2 Corinthians 3.18, hear the word of the Lord. We all, with unveiled faces, contemplate his glory, are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory, which comes from the Lord, who is the Spirit. So what does this mean, and how does it happen? Um, you know the word transform there, slide, is um, metamorphosis, uh, the amazing thing that only God could pull off, the DNA of the caterpillar. He's going along two-dimensionally, and goes through this transformation, this metamorphosis, and flutters off into the heavens. And so in, in a sense, that uh, happens in many different realms of our Christian life, going from glory to glory. <clears throat> so it's important to just remember there's a difference between uh, birth and growth as far as spiritually. Uh, a lot of confusion can come when we uh, confuse those two. Um, Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and verse 10 really explain, you know, highlight the difference there, that what does it take for me, if I'm a sinner, I've offended an infinite holy God, to know that my sin is forgiven and I'm going to heaven for eternity? Faith. Faith alone. That's all I can do. I can't. I'm a sinner. I don't have the spirit. I don't have the power. I need to put my trust in the Savior. And that's what it says, for by grace you're saved through faith. Now, what about verse 10? It says, a birth requires faith, but growth requires faith plus works. A lifetime of often hard labor to grow spiritually. We'll talk about that in a moment. Works are the spiritual disciplines. We're going to review those in just a moment. Uh, verse 10 says, we are his workmanship. I'll talk in a moment about one of the insane Hobbies and passions of mine is to build planes. This word uh, workmanship could say, could be interpreted masterpiece. Did you know that you are the masterpiece of the Lord of the universe? That he's wanting to work on your soul, but not against your will. He'll only take us as far as we are saying, here I am, Lord, send me. Um, the, the, the start of the, the growth process is a total submission, day by day, moment by moment, to the Lord. So um, let's look at another verse here in Philippians. <clears throat> Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. I thought, uh, is, does it say work for or work out? Work out. Okay, so be very careful to see the difference there. We don't work for our salvation as far as going to heaven, but we work out our salvation as far as growing to be Christ-like. Huge difference. What does it say? For God, who works in you, he's, the Greek would say energizes you from the inside, divine enablement, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. Um, I was saying a moment ago, we need to be very careful when we say, well, this is just the way I am. Quack, quack, quack. I'm, I'm doomed to waddle through the rest of my spiritual days on this earth. Wait a minute. We have infinite power available as believers as we fall on our knees and say, Lord, help me to be better in how I love and care for people in my life, for example. Okay, let's take a look for a moment on what does it mean to be transformed from glory to glory? Taking a drink of water. <clears throat> I like this. Uh, it says... Moses asked to see the Lord's glory. And you say, well, what is that? The goodness of God is a manifestation of his glory. To be changed from glory to glory, we need to be increasing in what makes up his glory. We're made in his image. We're made to be his ambassadors, his representatives in time and space. So what's, what's his characteristics? That's what we should be, by his grace and strength, energized to do. 
we need to be increasing, changing from glory to glory, in compassion, graciousness, patience, love, faithfulness, forgiveness. Increasing in these things is what will take you from glory to glory. It's interesting, listening to Bobby's message last Sunday, he said there were a, period, a series of people in his life who were expecting him to do all this stuff. Get your act together. Stop drinking. Stop this. Do this. Do this. If they had any sense, they realize if he's not saved, he doesn't have the power to do any of that. So to expect an unbeliever to act like a believer is saying we don't really need the Savior. On the other hand, if someone has been saved and they say, well, this is just the way I am, you just got to live with it. I'm going to be like this. Word for it. No, you have the Spirit of God living in you. And as you trust and obey, growth happens. <clears throat> so uh, let's look at a couple examples. This is a little private examination. Don't take offense against me between you and God. Um, the scriptures say, and we all with unveiled faces contemplate the Lord's glory are being transformed into his image with ever-increasing glory. So there could be a lot to be said about that um, with unveiled face. Slide 12. <laughs> um, th with unveiled face, that's revealing, could be revealing the true you. Um, do people in your life, in your realm, in your family, your work world, see the glory of God manifested in your countenance, in your life, in the joy? Could it be that, I ask myself these same questions, has your besetting sin, whatever it may be, maybe your secret thought life, stolen your joy? Could it be that maybe you harbored a critical, judgmental spirit which hides the glory of this and the spirit of the Lord? You know, the scriptures say things that if we really understand them are not difficult to do, they're impossible. It says, love your enemies. Do good to those who spitefully use you. Can I do that in my own strength? No, I need to get on my knees and say, Lord, I can't do this, but you've promised me the power to forgive those who uh, despitefully use me. Have you harbored a, a defensive, full, retaliatory, harsh spirit for every little slight or offense you might have sinned? I'm, part of my testimony is I'm so grateful that the Lord has been changing my heart over a number of years from being a self-centered, miserable, it's all about me person to I just, I'm not to boast, but that the Lord, boast in the Lord, he has changed me to how can I minister and love and encourage other people? That's been a change. Thanks to what we're going to see in a moment. This, um, so yeah, I love the example of Jesus. Um, when Jesus was reviled, he did not revile back again. What does it mean to revile? Abusively insulted. Do you ever feel abusively insulted by someone? What's your game plan? What's your flight plan to respond to that? Jesus, when we reviled, did not revile in return. When suffered, he did not threaten, but continued to entrust himself to him who judges justly. Well, is that easy to do by your own strength? No. But in trusting the Lord, praying for a power. So how does this change happen? Well, this is what we're leading up to. How is change possible for me? Uh, I just love these songs. Uh, one benefit of, of occasionally speaking in church is I get to choose some songs. So I got three of my favorite hymns today. Amen. <laughs> um, I just love these uh, words. Have thine own way, Lord. Hold over my, my being. Absolute sway. That's total submission. I've had the practice for years. I wake up in the morning. I splash water on my face. And I fall down on my knees. And Lord, I'm reporting for duty. What do you want me to do today? Who do you want to minister to? How can I love? How can I do, be what you want me to be? As the day goes on, coming into a new activity... Pray it again. Every time I'm trying to go to uh, church or to work or to this or to that, I, I'm praying, Lord, I'm submitting. What are you calling me? I am your representative in time and space in Ocala, Florida. And I, I'm quietly listening to the Lord. You know, give so-and-so a call. 
put them on my heart. Do it. Um, so it starts with an attitude of total submission. Um, another thing that I think a lot of us struggle with, if you had asked the question, um, what do you think one of the biggest sins we believers fall over Jesus sin? I would say one of the biggest sins we sin is to be fearful and anxious. Throughout the scriptures, there's an imperative, a command to us believers. Be anxious for nothing. Do not fear. Marjorie pointed out to us recently that there's over 365 times in the scripture that in essence says, fear not, don't be anxious. <clears throat> um, what's the antidote to worry, the path to peace? Peace. Don't be anxious about anything. Pray about everything. Now, I grew up in a wonderful family with five kids, not five daughters, but five of us. And um, I had a very loving father, Joe, and his great love and concern for the safety of his family. Well, back in the day, shows how old I am, we used to have Volkswagen microbus. And then we had an ambassador station wagon. You guys ever, young kids ever heard of a station wagon? Um, so we would jump in the car, us five Magnuson kids along with mom, and start down the road. We're going somewhere. How would it grieve the heart of my father if I'm sitting in a seat right behind him, shouting in his ear, Daddy, Daddy, can we trust you? Are you watching the road? And you think about the anxiety a lot of us struggle with in life, how it grieves the heart of the Father, that he's, he's fully capable of, of, to be worthy of our total trust in the direst of situations. So I'm thankful. What's the problem? Um, why why we're we saying, is this difficult to do? No, it's impossible. If we're relying on our own strength to trust the Lord in the difficult situations of life. We need to fall on our knees and, and bring that up to the Lord. Lord, I have a fretful, frightful, fearful, anxious spirit. Heal me of it. And trust him that the power will be there to do that. I love the words of the song, um, Have thine own way, Lord. Have thine own way. Wounded and weary, help me, I pray. Power, all power. Surely is thine. Touch me and heal me, Savior divine. Is that your prayer today? Um, so you say, well, Peter, where, where does it say? That's just a song. Where does that say that in the scripture? 2 Peter 1.3, his divine power, who's, who's the power? God of the universe has given us everything we need for a godly life. God's not going to ask you to do something that he hasn't going to equip you and give you the power to do. Um, I love Francis Havergale. Um, the song we sang already, take my life and let it be consecrated all to thee. That, that should be the passion of our life. That everything, is, um, as we're increasing our faith, some of the dark areas of life, we're submitting, we're submitting, we're submitting. and um, We're being transformed from glory to glory. Now, <clears throat> I was uh, so blessed by Bobby's testimony last Sunday. And uh, he was using a passage from Psalm 142. And uh, the writer says, I looked in my life and nobody cared for my soul. Well, I want to say part of my testimony is I'm so glad someone, in my case, my mom and dad, cared for my soul. Back 125 years ago, no, <laughs> I'm 131 half years old. I was thinking about that. Um, I'm eight and a half years old, just a little bit younger than Bryn. And um, my dad faithfully marched us kids off every night to an old-fashioned tent crusade in Cape Cod, Massachusetts. Um, I actually have the bullet in there, July 1962. Um, and, and I'm just an eight and a half year old kid, and I heard a clear gospel message presented. Uh, and I, um, I walked the sawdust trail and came forward and put my trust in the Savior. Um, similar to Bobby, this slide. <clears throat> I didn't understand a lot about the faith, but uh, I did understand John 3.16, and I was able to 
personalize it. The, the scripture in the old King James says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have eternal life. So I've used this illustration before, but um, what does it mean to believe in Jesus? Um, slide. 30 years ago this month, I was a pilot crew member with Pan American World Airways. And our mission was to take 254 people, passengers, from Kennedy Airport to Barbados. And guess what's in our path? Slide. Hurricane Hugo. Anybody remember Hurricane Hugo? Same path that Dorian seems to be taking. So up at Kennedy, and when we were boarding, I'm in my uniform, and I'm standing by the jetway as people are coming on board. Lots of nervous passengers. So as they entered into the plane, Hurricane Hugo's down the road, and they entered in the plane, the question is, did they take a left turn or did they take a right turn? Did they come into the cockpit and say, excuse me, Captain, I'll be flying this plane tonight. Well, who are you? Do you know how to do this? Or when they come on board, do they take a right turn and then find their assigned seat and sit down? In that act, they're putting their trust in the faith in the pilot and the plane to safely get them through the dark and stormy night to the other side. What does it mean to believe in Jesus? It's resting. It's not working. It's resting. It's trusting that when he died on the cross, he paid the full penalty of my sin. So praise God, slide. When I came to know the Savior at a tender young age of eight and a half, I personalized that just like Bobby said. For God so loved Peter, you can put your name on there, that he gave his only son, begotten son Jesus, that if Peter will trust in the Savior, not get his act together, trust, rest in what Jesus did, he will not perish but have everlasting life. Can you see the contracts there between working? So, so here's the question now. Um, let's go to the next slide. Let's say when I was born, that's not me, but <laughs> my parents say, oh, Peter, welcome to our world. Let's put you in the crib down in your room. And by the way, the refrigerator with the food is down the hall in the kitchen and have a nice life. Is that what they did? No, that's, we, we do a great service sometimes when people come to faith later in life and we say, well, go to Sunday school class X or a small group and here's the Bible and have a nice life. No, they're spiritual babes or infants. We need to nurture and encourage them and work with them side by side, one on one. I'm so grateful for many people in my life. We went to churches all over the world, wonderful churches, the ministry to them. But in hindsight, if, some, if I'd been more willing and if hindsight, if somebody would have come to me personally and said, Peter, how can I work with you individually to bring you to the next step of your walk with the Lord. So uh, slide. Instead of just saying, Peter, the food's down the hallway, have a nice life. We know you're a spiritual baby. No, my parents and the church gave me 15 wonderful years in this church up on Cape Cod. Nurture, care, and instruction. My, the peop my parents and the people of the church cared for my soul. And my, part of my testimony is I'm so grateful to them for doing that. Uh, just briefly, slide. I went on and had a 40-year career as a professional pilot. I used to fly around <coughs> fighter jets with my hair on fire. That's why I don't have any hair today. <coughs> and then, um, slide, went on into commercial flying. I didn't, I, when I was part of this church, you know, I was gone a lot when I was still working. By the way, anybody guess what the uh, mountain is there in Turkey? Mount Ararat, maybe where the ark is. Fine. But the point of this um, history is I was able to be in that environment, kind of like a Sin City environment. But thanks to the nurture instruction, I, I, was, I was able to avoid by Spirit's power all the booby traps. I was able to live, and I'm boasting for the Lord, a pure and holy life all through that. 
the um, pilot world is prone to be both the military fighter pilots and the commercial. It's a potty mouth cu culture, toilet talk. You know, some pilots, God bless them, have perfected putting a bad word into every sentence. I'm boasting to the Lord, I've never had a bad word come out of my mouth. And the power to live and do what God calls us to do is available. It's are we willing to take that power and trust and obey? <clears throat> well, I was so grateful both in uh, the pi different pilot worlds of many opportunities of sharing my faith with lost pilots. Did you know that the skies are full of lost pilots, spiritually speaking? Um, I, part of the, would be crossing the Atlantic and you're in a cockpit with another pilot for 10 hours or crossing the Pacific and uh, hearing their stories and what train wrecks. And I, I'm not saying that to put them down, but their lives were just disasters uh, for multiple reasons. And, and it just highlighted how grateful I was for this wonderful godly bring. I'm so excited about what's happening with the kids' ministry here that uh, we can do that nurture and instruction and setting a solid footing on the ground. Well, <clears throat> One day, I was flying somewhere or other with Pan Am, talking with the captain, and we're at 35,000 feet, sharing my faith. And he had told a story I about fell off my chair when he said it. He, his name was Buck. I've been telling him about Jesus and salvation. And he says, let me tell you a story. I have a friend, eight-and-a-half-year-old Johnny, was a friend of Buck, the airline captain, and they like to go fishing together. So... He said, the cap, Buck's telling me the story. He says, recently he was out with his eight and a half year old friend, Johnny, and they're, they're fishing. And Johnny, the little boy, turns to the airline captain and says, Buck, if you were to die today, do you know you're going to heaven? And I said, Wow, I was saved at eight and a half years old. Why did it take me almost 10 years entering into college before I started sharing my faith? You can, you can share your faith just like Johnny did at eight and a half years of age. Amen? So uh, that was just a, a godsend. It was a conviction. I hope you as believers, followers of Jesus, you welcome conviction. When the Spirit, it might be painful, kind of taps on you at a certain point in your life, you say, you're right, Lord. Thank you. I appreciate that. I take that. Um, help me to overcome that shortcoming, that sin. So that, 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 i never forget that day that uh, Buck told the story about eight-and-a-half-year-old Johnny who was sharing his faith effectively with his airline captain. So uh, I, I started talking about um, ducks and duck church. So in my mind, I've been saying this, thinking there's a lot of parallels between how do you get a home-built plane constructed and built and flying safely Versus how do you get your spiritual life on track to, to grow and to become all Christ wanted to be. Um, I've, I foolishly have built four airplanes. You think I'd have a hole in my head right now or something like that. So these are the three ducks are in my hangar. And they have girls' names. So on the right there you see uh, Franey. That means truth, a Swiss girl's name. And Annie. That means grace. And the new member of, this field, of, the, of the ducks is Oma. What does Oma mean? It's the German word for grandmother. Well, let me tell you a little bit about Oma. Um, Oma is a 20-plus-year-old hangar queen. She has never flown. I, I bought the project from two previous builders, and we collectively have put thousands of hours in her. She's never even waddled to the runway. She just sits there in the hangar. <clears throat> and people come and ask, is she ever going to fly? <laughs> you know? um, so when I first got her, she was a very ugly duckling. And as I got to know more, she had problems. And I maybe you haven't seen much of me lately. One of my joys and passions is to do visitation of members of the body here. And one of the prices I've had to pay is I've been not able to do that so much because I'm trying to get Oma finished. Um, she was very ugly duckling, but 
Next slide. Um, 20 months later, of uh, untold blood, sweat, and tears, I'll spare you all the details, she still doesn't fly. But recently, uh, Oma is starting to change from glory to glory. After many, many years of obedience in the same direction, uh, of a lot of hard work, she's starting to change from glory to glory. That's what I want to look at in just a moment, that spiritual life change is a long obedience in the same direction. It's trusting and obeying day by day for every day of your life. That's how spiritual change starts to happen. We'll look at that in a moment. <clears throat> so um, who knows, maybe this week I might be so far to start Oma's engine for the first time. So maybe if you see me next week, say, Peter, how did it go with Oma? <laughs> um, so prayerfully, sometime by Christmas this year, she will be in her glory, flying. She might look something like this, performing well, being what she's destined to be. How do you get as a believer, follower of Jesus to be who God destines you to be? It can take a long obedience in the same direction, trust and obey in every area of your life. So that's the parallels. I've, I've found in, um, we're talking with builders and pilots over the years, when someone comes to me and says, oh, I think I'm going to build an airplane, I try to talk them out of it. I, you don't want to go there unless it's a passion in your life and you've got nothing better to do, you know, do not build an airplane. Um, but if you do, there's three questions that really need to come up over and over and over again for your motivation, for your clarity, for your focus. And these are the same questions I think we as believers need to ask as far as where are keeping our growth on track. What will be a cost and commitment to follow Jesus? You need to be clear on that. I, I don't think I have the slide here, but sometimes we, there's a slide that someone sent me recently that shows, well, you're just kind of on autopilot in your spiritual life just kind of growing into glory. No bumps on the road. And, other, well, and then the other part of the slide says, God's plan. And it's like this. And we grow through the trials is the point. Um, this a question with building planes is the same as with our spiritual lives. There's a thousand tasks, a hundred tasks to be done. And I've found that it can get overwhelming if I'm thinking about all these things. And what you've got to do is make a little list and say, this one thing I do today is this task. And that's the same thing we can do in our spiritual lives, is to prayerfully get before the Lord and say, today, Lord, what do you want me to do? Another question would be, to keep in our mind, to keep the motivation going, is what is my reward for following the Lord? Make sure the clock on the wall is the same. Yep, it's good. <laughs> um, it's, it's the same, same questions. What will your reward be? Slide. The reward for building Oma will be the payoff is in the takeoff. That it's a four-seat plane, I've, bigger than anything else I've ever built, and to take people up. The other part of it was, is it not advancing? There you go. I've got a dream with Oma. We live in where? Ocala, Florida? That she'll fly me to Fairbanks, Alaska, to Denali, Mount McKinley. 20,000 highest peak in the United States. So that's kind of motivation to get through to some of the rough parts is to keep the reward in mind. We'll talk in a moment about the reward for following Christ, following Jesus. So let's go now to some of these questions as far as the parallels here. Your destiny and calling as a believer is increasing Christ's likeness. I know years ago I started praying, Lord, you remember at a county fair, there used to be these big, bright, 100,000 candle light, uh, spotlights that did shine around in the heavens. I started praying, Lord, shine the light like that around in my life and show me where the dark areas are and help me get rid of them for your glory. That you're willing to do a self-examination. Our relationship is based on grace, so we shouldn't fear this. Once you trust in the Lord, put your trust in the Lord as a believer, you're not going to be disowned. The question is about your walk with the Lord, your relationship, your day-by-day your -day experience, and, and trusting and obeying. So um, 
what would be your cost and commitment? In simple, simple terms, a long obedience in the same direction and all things in your life, you ask yourself a question when you're having a, an encounter with a person or something, Lord, how can I, in this situation, trust you and obey you? Trust you and obey you. And then you listen to the Spirit as he calls the Scripture to mind or whatever, that you're engaged in your mind, you're engaged in the Spirit as you walk through life. Trust and obey 24 hours a day. Um, that's the simple answer of what it's going to cost and your commitment. Okay, um, here's some questions for you. Do you ever feel kind of like a spiritual lethargy? Do you ever feel like a million pound load of inertia that you believe you can never spiritually overcome? You've got a besetting sin or something like that. You just seem to have a long time struggle. Do you feel that maybe you, you know, this, what you're saying, Peter, is true for you, but for me, uh, I don't think I could ever be changed from glory to glory um, in my walk with the Lord. So, well, I want to tell you that there's hope. The, one of the last planes I flew before I retired, 747 Jumbo, one million pound gross takeoff weight. How these planes fly, I have no clue. I don't know. It's just magic. But the parallel in, in my mind is um, one of the big, biggest uh, keys to growing in your spiritual life is the commitment to the spiritual disciplines. We've showed this before, but I love the old navigator's wheel. You see the two vertical, time in the word, prayer and, and worship, and the two horizontal, witness and service, and fellowship. By the way, um, today I'm going to go to Scooby's Sub, prayerfully for some fellowship. Amen? <laughs> um, so did you know, next slide, that you, believer, have four throttles that you can push up on the four spiritual disciplines? Did you know that? Your hand is on those throttles, not the Lord's, not my handle, not your wife's handle, handle, uh, hand or anybody else. Your hand is on those throttles. It's your choices that you make how to invest your time in the spiritual disciplines. So I'm pushing up right after the service today the fellowship throttle. Um, so you imagine you're a captain at Anchorage Airport in this case with a 747. You've got the four throttles there. It's quite a feeling. You put your hand there, and you go and set takeoff thrust. And what happens? This monster beast starts to move. Well, that's the same thing if you can follow the analogy with your spiritual life, that as you commit to time. So what's the problem? Our modern-day lives in particular are so busy. We're so full of distractions and trivial pursuits that... We say, well, we don't have any time to do these spiritual disciplines. Well, that's a choice. Whose hand is on the throttle? What are you doing in your life that really is not impacting your desire to grow in Christ-likeness? That's a question to ask at all times. Okay, slide. <clears throat> By the way, that last one, in a moment, we're going to come to the Lord's table. And some of the traditional reading, it says, let a man examine himself and a woman. This is a spiritual thing to do, that you prayerfully in the quietness of your heart, you say, Lord, which of those disciplines do you want me to work on this week, this day, this moment? Okay. Um, it's interesting, a very familiar verse uh, from Isaiah. Those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. So how would you describe what waiting on the Lord means? Well, I would say, and I like to keep things simple, trust and obey. You're trusting the Lord and you're obeying him. That's waiting on the Lord. And what's the promise? They shall mount up with wings like eagles. You can climb, you can soar in your spiritual life. And this is part of my testimony that as I've been doing this, I didn't really fully understand what I was doing but as you apply yourself to the spiritual disciplines, you can and you will grow. Okay, slide. 
So uh, we've been saying, what is your cost and commitment as a believer to follow Jesus? If you really want to uh, go from glory to glory, it's a long obedience in the same direction in all things. You're choosing to trust and obey the Lord. Um, the scripture says, consider the cost, count the cost. This is something you can really think about. What does it cost me to do? And I'm making the commitment, yes, yes, Lord, I will pay that cost. I, by nature, don't like to be up front. I don't like it to be about me. Um, the last thing I'd ever choose to do was to stand in a pulpit and bring a message. <laughs> but out of obedience, if the Lord's call me to minister, then I humbly submit and say, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I will do that. Slide, slide. Uh, I just love Francis Ridley Havergale, who wrote, uh, Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Is that your desire? I would submit to you that each of us needs to submit our schedule to the Lord. Have you ever done this? Prayerfully sit down and think, okay, I've got to work eight hours a day. But the discretionary time, what did I do with it? The many things that we're involved with doing in our free time, which are not bad, but what, what do they say? What's the worst enemy of the good? The, the, the worst enemy of the best? The good. So prayerfully before the Lord, we look at the, the time consumers in my life, our life. I'm not saying this legalistically, but I'm just saying I've been blessed recently. I have a struggle being a forlorn old bachelor sometimes being lonely. So sometimes in, when I sit down to have a meal, I turn on the TV. And I like to watch old black and white cowboy movies and stuff like that. Is that an evil thing? Is that a bad thing in itself? No, but I get addicted. You know, somebody shot showing so well, who, who done it? And suddenly an hour or two goes by. So similar to an alcoholic needs to stay away from the package store, a month or two ago I said, Peter, life's too short, no more of that. I just stopped, I haven't turned the TV on in two months. I'm not saying that legalistically, I'm saying it's been a blessing to help me in my spiritual growth. Slide. <clears throat> um, we're going to sing this song right at the end of our service. This is a prayerful moment-by-moment moment prayer that you can pray. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. You are the potter, I am the clay. While I'm waiting, yield it and still. That submission, that trust to the Lord is something that should be just uh, so much part of your life that people can see the joy in your life because you know that you're solidly in the center of the Lord's will for your life. So uh, second of those questions is where should you con concentrate your efforts? A single-minded focus on the call of the Lord has you in your life. Um, slide. I like what Paul says in one of the translations is, none of these other things move me. These inconveniences, these circumstances, this jail sentence, this whatever, it doesn't move me. Uh, I don't count any of it of any value or precious, if only that I might finish my course and the ministry I received from the Lord Jesus to testify to the gospel, the good news of the grace of God. So when you have that passion in your life, it's really amazing how the stress levels go down. You're just saying, I'm just marching and praising the Lord. And whatever people think of me or insult me or do me evil, I don't care. It doesn't bother me. I'm staying on course. So I, <clears throat> I like uh, what Paul said. Not that I've already obtained this or already am perfect. Paul said, the Apostle Paul says he wasn't perfect. But he's on the trail. He says, but one thing I do, not 40 things you dabble in, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind, straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal, the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. What are those things that you're forgetting in the behind? Maybe your successes and maybe your failures. Forget them, they're behind. Move forward. Sometimes we think, oh, I had this wonderful ministry in the past. Great. What's God have for you today? Slide. Uh, so where should you come, uh, concentrate your efforts? I would tell you that maybe this is a little foreign to you. You don't like to be more free-going. 
but this enormous value to do, uh, to try to schedule and look at your life and say, is what I'm doing really getting me to the goals that I want the Lord to be pleased with in my life? So I'm, uh, is it why consecrate your schedule? Because the Spirit of the Lord will only fill those areas of my life that I'm willing to empty. He's a gentleman. He's not going to push himself. If I'm not willing to make space in my life for the Lord, whatever that may look like, he's not going to be filled. The more I submit and open up my life, the greater this filling of the Spirit. Amen? Why consecrate your schedule? If you don't plan your day, guess what? Someone else or something, Hurricane Dorian, whatever, will plan it for you. Anybody believe that's true? Amen? Okay. So the final question that we've been looking at is, what will be your reward? We said um, for the um, Oma, if she ever's finished, appreciate any encouraging words in the next few months, (laughs) um, fly it to Alaska. Well, what's your reward for faithful following of the Lord Jesus in your life? There's two, I would say, in simple terms. We could talk all day long about the rewards, but there's reward in the present life and in eternal life. Here we are, a measly little 80, 90 years, whatever, in this existence in these bodies. But the scriptures test we are bound for eternity with a new resurrection body. I'm looking forward to that. New eyes, new ears, new brain, maybe some hair. <laughs> so, um, for eternity with the Lord. So, um, go ahead. I really like the, um, my favorite of all songs, as some of you know, is Trust and Obey. And this has been my test, my, uh, my experience. What do the words say? Verse 4. But we never, back up, but we never can prove that's in joy or experience the delights of his love until all on the altar we lay. For the favor he shows and the joy he bestows are for them who will trust and obey. That's been my experience for as long as I've been walking with the Lord, that uh, um, this joy and the favor he bestows are for those who will trust and obey him. That's the relationship with the Lord. Okay, what about the hereafter? Uh, Someday you're going to be transported into the wildest experience of your life into eternity. What's going to be there? What is your passion as you're living in this life? Your, if your passions, life's passion is to receive that well done from the Lord, it's going to affect how you live today. Um, I just love this passage. It says, The Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful in these little things I asked you to do. Love your wife, be a good employee, and a uh, on and on and things that the Lord asked you to do. I'm going to make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Is that your life passion to living for the day when you're going to see the Savior, the King of Kings face to face, and you want him to say, well done, good and faithful servant. So, I just um, want to say that As Bobby's testimony was uh, so powerful, how someone was able to reach out to him, share the love of the Lord, and the good, good gospel message, and he was saved. He didn't have time to go through and say how his growth happened. He mentioned the many ministries he was able to do. And my passion and testimony is that people would move beyond just bench warming and pews and a waddling existence, but I want to say, brothers and sisters, by the power of God, through trusting and obeying Him, you can fly. You can spread your wings, and you can fly. That's been my testimony. I've seen it so true throughout my entire life. I just uh, thank you. Let's, Let's lift up our hearts to the Lord in prayer. Father, we cannot thank you enough. We cannot praise you enough. You've created us. You've given us life and breath. You've called us to know you. You shed the blood of your son 
to cleanse us from our sin, that we might find forgiveness, hope, and healing, which could never be found on our own, can never be found in this world. You've given us a purpose. You've given us life and breath. The body of your son is rep representation that we need you, and we love you, and we thank you, we praise you, and we remember you. We thank you in the name of Jesus. Amen.